Welcome to our evening sermon series looking at the Lord's Prayer. I'll be reading Psalm 143, 8-10. Do you turn to the passage in your Bibles or look it up on your electronic devices. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your spirit lead me on level ground. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Amen. A 19th century poet uh, named William Henley, whilst recovering from surgery, wrote a poem called Invictus. Now, this seemed at first glance to be a kind of a heroic little rhyme about uh, defying circumstances. But at the end, he says this and he writes, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And so what he's saying here is it doesn't matter about a straight and narrow way of truth. It doesn't matter what sins I've done. I control my destiny. My will be done. And if we're honest, whether we're Christians or not, we all feel that sense of defiance, don't we, of self-reliance at times. And so when Jesus challenges us to pray, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It completely cuts across this and challenges us instead to say what God says and does is right, his will be done. And that means whatever he wants for my life. And it's hard sometimes, isn't it, to surrender ourselves like this. Paul empathises with us completely when he says in Romans, the things that I long to do, I fail to do, and the things I long not to do, I do. So he knows full well how hard it can sometimes be. And so as we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, how is his will actually done in heaven? Firstly, it's done joyfully. And here and now, God doesn't want obeying him to be something grudging or hard that just crushes us. This is the God who in Jesus promises us a burden and a yoke that's light because it's based in knowing him, not just in do's and don'ts. God's will is done in heaven completely and it's also done resting in the presence of God forever, because heaven is the place of rest and reward. And we know, don't we, that our obedience here and now is far from perfect. But we also know that we rest in the victory of a saviour who did obey the Father perfectly at great cost and has won for us the merits of that obedience. And because of that, we can be helped and motivated in our journey in obedience to God's will by knowing the God um, who has redeemed us and has made us such great eternal promises. In Daniel, it tells us this, those who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. In his book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer tells us this, we turn our knowledge about God into knowledge of God when we turn every truth that scripture tells us about him into meditation before him leading to prayer and praise to him. And so this with allowing the, um, the spirit to direct us in his word as we do this helps to make prayer more than just that dutiful thing that we're supposed to do when we're still half asleep in the morning or tired out at night. Calvin tells us that prayer is a bit like a treasure hunt because when we pray we penetrate spiritual riches that are stored up for us in heaven. 
In appealing to God's promises, we learn from experience that our faith in them is well founded. And so it's God himself, experienced and loved, that helps us to stand on his promises, his word and his commandments, to say for ourselves, thy will be done. And so knowing that we're right with God, knowing that we know him, we also know that his spirit helps us, whispers to us, teaches us from his word. Psalm 143 verse 10 says this, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. In John's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit and he says that the Spirit will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And we so often need this, don't we? We need that nudging of the Spirit because saying to God, your will, not mine be done, even though we know him, we know all that he's done for us, we know of the depths of his love for us, still isn't always easy. It cuts across our emotions, our wants, our opinions, our judgments of people and our will. It can mean great sacrifice. For some it's meant great danger. And it means allowing God to refine and shape us in a way that's often painful when we have to stare our failings in the face. And that's why we need the peace and joy of knowing God that's anchored to him, not to what we might be feeling at any given moment. And so sometimes it's good just to be raw and honest and just say, God, I don't understand this. I think differently from what your word tells me. Would you help me? by your spirit, to see it as you see it. And so it also means having faith in God's providence or working in the world. Many people are asking right now, why won't God just end the coronavirus? How can I say thy will be done to a God who can't or won't do that? Sometimes when we're walking through suffering, it's not the moment when we want to hear answers on this. We're hurting badly and we need care. And then hopefully we know we have good people around us or we might be being those good people to others. But we can also know how much God is with us and that in Jesus he's been through everything that we go through. When Jesus in Gethsemane is praying, what does he say? He says, not my will, but yours be done. He wins his own spiritual battle. He models what he's asking of us here perfectly. And now, as we seek to do the same, he prays for us in heaven, cheering us on to victory in our own battles. Because when God created us, we bought into the lie of Invictus. Whether you take Adam and Eve as literal or figurative, the spiritual truth that they bequeathed to us is that we were conned by the devil into thinking that what God says or thinks isn't true, that we're fine on our own. And so now, not only we, but the whole world around us are not what they were meant to be. And so there's war and there's famine or there's sickness because we were given the dignity of free will, but we didn't use it wisely. And that's why we have to say in the end that our friend in Invictus is finally wrong. To agree with God that we can't make it on our own. We don't have all the answers. We don't see the big pictures. That's why if we read David's physical enemies as spiritual for us now, Psalm 143 verse 9 says, 
rescue me from my enemies, O God, for I hide myself in you. In this spiritual battle that's in the world, we've been liberated and we've changed sides. Once we were part of the problem, but now we're part of the solution. We're the salt of the earth, Jesus tells us. We're the light of the world. And that's about doing good in the world that God may be glorified. And it's also about proclaiming him. And if we pray that he'd help us to take those opportunities when he gives them to us, that's part of praying for his will to be done. But it's also about spiritual warfare. Jesus rises from death and redemption begins. When Jesus returns, everything will be renewed again. And Paul in Romans talks about the world groaning, longing for redemption. But though the war is won, though Colossians tells us how at the cross the powers of darkness were put to open shame, we live in that time of tension, waiting for the final redemption and the darkness hasn't given up. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's still battle, there's still spiritual warfare. And we've seen battles won, haven't we, when people or institutions that we function in or with have opened up to Christian presence after perhaps years of hostility. And so as it seems that our country moves further and further from God in its laws and values and beliefs, do we feel that concern? Will we bear it up in prayer? Will we pray for Christians in public life and politics, whether or not we happen to agree with them politically? And this spiritual warfare is one of the main reasons, I think, why we're told to pray for God's will to be done on earth. Knowing our God, as we've explored earlier, helps to keep us strong in that battle. The people who know their God, the Saviour who promises to us that he has overcome the world, will do exploits, will be strong in this fight. And so God is not the author of evil, but he does use it providentially. As an example, on Sunday, the 3rd of May this year, an Observer article um, reported that during the coronavirus crisis in the UK, a quarter of British adults have watched or listened to an online church service. One in 20 has begun praying for the first time ever. A third of young adults aged between 18 and 34 have tuned in to an online service. Of all those who have tuned into any form of online church, one in five, 20%, had never been to church before. So this virus may be a natural happening in a fallen world or it may turn out to be man-made. But God is using it to cause people to seek him. So we all want life to get back to normal, don't we? We all um, want to have to not be so fearful and so careful. And as I record this, it's Sunday afternoon on the 10th of May and we're all waiting tonight to see what the PM's directions are for the next steps with perhaps slightly bated breath. But in praying for that resolution, for the light at the end of the tunnel, in praying for people's safety. Let's as well be praying that God will continue to use this 
to cause people to think about him. And not when it's over, for all those people who've perhaps encountered the gospel and church for the first time online, it's only the beginning of a conversion, a journey of faith. Let's be contending in prayer for the online Christianity Explore course that's beginning soon. Who are we praying for to come to know the Lord in this time? And as well as life and circumstances, of course, there's his work in our hearts too. What might there be that God is nudging us to do or not do that we resist. And so finally the Puritan Thomas Watson points us to some of the benefits of all this, of seeking to embody God's will and embed it in our lives. It benefits us, it honours God in our world, it makes us more Christ-like, it gives us peace in life. And death. We can be assured that our God is in control. But C.S. Lewis tells us something else, a kind of caveat, a kind of warning. He says, there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Invictus, your will be done. Have it your way. And that's not to make us paranoid about the times when we fail or need to get our hearts right, but it is just telling us that our choices matter and that in the end they are eternal. And so if you've tuned into one of our services and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, why not give consideration to his claim that his will, his providence, might be the only sure path through the turmoil of this time. Think about our Exploring Christianity course. Psalm 143 verse 8 speaks about knowing his love every morning, seeking his face for the way we should go and it's the greatest peace in this world that there is and so if we do know him let's be assured of this truth too let's be assured that his providence is working through this time of chaos and let's keep bringing before him the areas of our lives where we need to say thy will be done